Got to get audio going here somewhere. Therefore, we, we find out that when they come together, they ask him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? These are his own apostles. They've been with him for three years. He's been teaching. He's been telling them what's going to happen. And they're still confused. And they are asking, will you at this time restore the kingdom? Remember, all the Jews were confused. They thought he was coming. The Messiah would come, in a sense, on a great white horse. And he's going to establish his kingdom. He's going to set up the kingdom in Jerusalem. But this is not the picture at all. So they're still confused. They wonder. Still his own apostles. They, like many of the religious Jewish leaders at the time, were still looking for an earthly kingdom. In fact, many still today are looking for an earthly kingdom. Jesus, in their minds, is going to come back, go to Jerusalem, and establish his kingdom. However, after the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the apostles, you don't find them confused anymore. You don't find them asking about this earthly kingdom they go about to establish the church that the Lord Jesus set up. Look in Acts 1 verse 7. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Do we sometimes ask for too much information? Are we not as Christians to walk by faith and not by sight? And yet sometimes we, we want detail. We, we show me, people today say, show me and I'll believe. Well, that's not faith. And so Jesus rebukes them and said, this information is not for you to know. Now listen, what God will do and when God will do it and where God will carry it out is God's business. It's not our business. God doesn't have to tell us what, when, where, and how. In Acts 1, verse 8, here's what he said. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so we realize they were to be, they were to be witnesses. They had a job. All of this is about their mission their purpose in life. And so he said, the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to come upon you for a reason that you might be witnesses. What they needed to know was that they were there for a reason, and they needed to wait on the Lord, wait on the Holy Spirit for the full measure of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was to come upon them. The Holy Spirit allowed them to not only perform miracles, but to speak in the language of all the people present. You see, seeing the apostles, seeing the tongues like as a fire come and sat upon the heads of the apostles, hearing the sound of the rushing mighty wind was not enough. The people there needed what? To hear the message of Jesus Christ. And that's what the purpose of the Holy Spirit was. It gave the apostles the ability to speak in a language which they had not learned. And the Bible records that the people heard them speak in their own tongue the wonderful works of God. So they're there. Holy Spirit's going to come upon them. And Jesus says, wait. Wait. Number four, Jesus returns to heaven. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him up out of their sight. And while they looked as, as he went up into heaven, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, two angels, who also said, Men of Galilee, why, why do you stand there gazing? Why are you still looking up? into the heaven. This same Jesus, whom was taken up from you into heaven, will come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. In a sense, they're saying, you've got work to do. Why are, why are you still standing here? Why are you still gazing up into the heaven? Get with it. 
You've got to get to Jerusalem. You've got to tarry there. The Holy Spirit's going upon you, and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Can you just imagine the apostles standing there with their mouths wide open? And the angel said, what are you doing? They're frozen. And we sometimes get frozen in amazement, and we realize, get back up on your feet. We've got work to do. For this same reason, Jesus came, and therefore the church is about to be established. Number five, waiting on the Lord. Look in verse 12 through 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, the Bible says, they went up into the upper chamber, upper room, where they were staying, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Why did Jesus go on to name all of these who were there, because Jesus wants people to realize these are the ones he's talking about. These are the ones he's speaking of, the apostles. From the beginning of Acts chapter 1 all the way through Acts chapter 2, he's dealing with the apostles. He's giving them commissions. He's giving them orders. He's telling what's going to happen to them, what they are now to do with this power of the Holy Spirit. So go to Jerusalem. A little, a little less than a mile. It's called a Sabbath day's journey. And I understand they came up with that measurement, roughly five-tenths or seven-tenths of a mile, because that was the distance of the furthest tents of the Israelites, the 12 tribes of Israel, encamped around the tabernacle. And so when they gathered together on the Sabbath day, they could not travel over a mile, over seven-eighths of a mile, and so that was the distance of the furthest tents of those tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so we find out they gather together. They go in the upper room. And again, he names who's there, the apostles. It's about the apostles. Some women were there and his brethren. Remember, his own brothers never really accepted Jesus to be the Messiah until after he resurrects from the grave. That's when the light bulb comes on. That's when they realize he truly is the Messiah, the Son of God. Hard to convince your own family, isn't it? Even so with Jesus. And while they were waiting, what did they do? They spent a lot of time in prayer. Plus, during this time, we find out that, number six, Peter does some housekeeping. There's work to be done. And so Peter, look in verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of the names was about 120, and here's what he said. So there were some things that needed to be done. With Judas now out of the picture, there's only 12 apostles. And there needs to be 12. I mean, there's only 11, excuse me, and there needs to be 12. And so Peter goes about leading in the appointing of another to be an apostle of Christ. We're going to deal more about that in a minute. But Judas made some mistakes in life. Anybody here ever made any mistakes? Judas had a problem with the love of money. And Judas sold our Lord out for 30 pieces of silver. He learned that's not always the answer. Judas didn't really have them come to him and say, well, here's what we'll give you. Here's what we'll do. The Bible says Judas went to them and he reasoned with them. and He negotiated with them. and He was offered 30 pieces of silver. Remember, the Bible says Judas was a thief. He had his hand in the money bag. He was the treasurer of the apostles. Can you believe that? And he was the thief. And obviously, he had a problem with the love of money. He sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And here the soldiers come now, 
with the troops, the Bible says, and Judas is leading. Not only does he sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, but he leads them, he guides them, he takes them to where he knows Jesus will be, there in the Garden of Gethsemane. In that agony throughout the night, praying, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. And yet Jesus said, not my will, thine be done. And you can just hear the troops and this army of men marching up that mountain. And here Judas arrives. He's leading the crowd. I think he's already got the money. I think he's already been paid. He's probably got the money jingling in his, in his pocket. And all the while, he's there to point out who this Messiah is. Who is Jesus? And so he guides them. He marches up with them. He's pretty brave with all these troops with him. They've got their torches and they've got their swords. And they say, we've come to arrest Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. I am he whom you speak. And the Bible said, they, those troops, that came with swords and staves in their, the Bible said they, they stepped backwards and they fell to the ground. I believe they fell to their knees in the presence of Almighty God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And here Judas probably is looking around him now, realizing he's the only one left standing. He doesn't feel so powerful now, does he? With the troops there with him, he felt like a mighty man, but not so now. And Judas betrays Jesus. The Bible says with a kiss. Can you imagine? The kiss of betrayal. And Judas is sorry for what he's done, and he goes back to the the chief priest and the elders, and he said, I've sinned. I've betrayed the very innocent blood of Jesus. You ever been used? You ever had somebody that you felt really liked you, and they were right there with you, but then you find out you were only used? And Judas was used. And he said, I've, I've sinned, I've done wrong. And you know what they said? We could care less. You see to it. We don't care. That's your problem, not our problem. And Judas is upset. He realizes he's done wrong, and he takes the money that now realizes it's of no value. It isn't worth what he did. And he throws the money. And he leaves. And he does something even worse. He hangs himself. You see, Judas realized money isn't the answer. He thought it was. He had it all in his hands. And yet he goes and throws it back because he knows that's not the answer. Listen to me. Jesus is the answer. Amen. And we realize that here in John Chapter 18, verse 6, the soldiers, the troops stepped back and they fell to their knees. Number, five, or number 7, the Bible says, the fate of Judas. Judas realizing he's blown it, he's, he's made a lot of mistakes. And in Acts 1, verse 18, it says, Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling down, the Bible said, headlong he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. Not a pretty scene, is it? The wages of iniquity. Judas not only sinned, they've all sinned, they've made mistakes, and so have we. But we realize Judas, in the case of the Bible, shows that he never repented, he never turned back to God. He was full of iniquity, the Bible said, full of evil. To the core. His love of money got the best of him. And falling down headlong, he burst open, the Bible said, which tells us his apostles 
left him hanging. No one took him down. There was no funeral service for Judas. They literally left him to rot. You see, Judas didn't have to do what he did. He, was, he made his own choice. The Bible said he went his own way. And in Matthew 26, verse 21 through 25, it shows that Jesus actually warned him ahead of time. Look, it said, Surely I say to you, one of you will betray me. The night before, this is at the supper where Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, all the apostles. Each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that has his hand with me in the dish is the one who's going to betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man had he not been born. Wow. In fact, after this, every time the apostles speak about Judas, they make it very plain, Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. And in number eight, Judas is replaced. Acts chapter 1, verse 21 through 21 says, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us, of his resurrection. So Matthias was chosen among two. Now keep in mind, here's Matthias along with the 120, who is an eyewitness. From the time Jesus was baptized of John, for three years all the way up until the time he ascended back into heaven. Matthias was just there. He was the witness. He was the follower. He was loyal, along with about 120. Little did he know that God had a purpose for him, that God could use him. And Matthias was chosen to be an apostle just before the day of Pentecost began. I want to tell you something. God isn't through with you yet. God has a purpose. God has a job for each of us. And I believe the best days are yet to come for the church, for witnessing, for winning souls to Christ. What about you today? Where do you stand with the Lord? If you would have been there on the day of Pentecost when the people were touched in the heart in Acts 2 and they asked, what shall we do? And Peter tells them, repent and be baptized. And they do just that. The Bible said they gladly received his word. They obeyed and were baptized. The Lord added them to the church. Will you today surrender? Will you obey? We're going to stand and sing our hymn of invitation. I surrender all, 366. Won't you come as we say? Let's go to God in prayer. And Craig, how about you close us out with prayer?